Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Michael McDougall. I'm a senior scientist at Gramatech. Uh, we've actually got a booth outside. Uh, you can talk to Curtis there. Um, I'll talk a bit about the company, just to give you kind of a, I think so. Can everyone hear me? Okay, you're good. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, Gramatech's a small company. We're based in upstate New York. Um, and our focus is on software analysis and manipulation. Uh, we were founded by a couple of professors, um, one, Tim Teitelbaum at Cornell, Tom Reps at Wisconsin. Uh, Tom Reps, in particular, is pretty well known in the programming language community. Um, and Gramatech has two sides. We do research and we do product development. Um, both focused on software analysis and manipulation. So for research, we primarily do um, NASA and DOD-sponsored research projects, a lot of SBIRs, if you're familiar with that system, some other projects. Um, and these focus on static and dynamic software analysis. So we try to look at a piece of software and infer important behavior. Um, will it crash? Uh, does it uh, have any buffer overruns? Um, will it uh, do something that it's expected to do? Um, and we do that with static analysis. That's where you look at a, a program without running it. And we also have techniques that use dynamic analysis, where you um, watch the program as it's executing and, and observe its behavior and try to uh, infer properties based on that. So a number of applications of this technology. Um, some of the big ones are uh, safety and reliability, um, security. Uh, DOD is interested in something they call producibility, and this is just kind of general. How do you develop uh, large systems so that they're maintainable and that they work the way they're supposed to do? Um, sounds easy in practice, of course, as the systems get very large, that becomes quite difficult. Um, so that's uh, a little bit about our research. Uh, and then historically, what we've done is uh, when uh, research projects turn out to be pretty successful, we transition them to the market. And uh, one of our tools is Code Surfer, and then a more recent one is called Code Sonar. This is one of the static analysis tools um, that a couple of people mentioned in, in talks earlier today. Uh, so one example that I, I think uh, maybe some of you are familiar with uh, is uh, Code Sonar is one of the static analysis tools that uh, was, and I think is still, being used to check the Mars Science Laboratory uh, flight code. Um, and we're checking for kind of the standard run-of-the-mill C, C++ problems of uh, crashes, null pointer dereferences, buffer overruns. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, in working with JPL, we developed a special version uh, that checked compliance with the JPL coding standard for C. And so you run one tool and you get uh, both uh, JPL coding standard violations as, as one set of reports and um, kind of the more general C, C++ bugs. Um, let's come on. Oh. Uh, we've got a, a range of customers, especially in the military aerospace uh, uh, world. Um, and uh, I think that probably some of the people in the room here are uh, customers as well, in particular, Software Research Institute, or the Southwest Research Institute is one of our customers, and Paul, I forget his last name actually, Curtis, but Woods. Paul Woods, right, uh, who spoke earlier, uh, um, it's one of our customers and, uh, and can talk to you about his experience in using the tool if you're interested, um, or find Curtis, or you can ask me about the tool, I know uh, quite a bit about it, um, and I suspect some of the NASA people here have, have used it too. All right, um, so that's a bit about code sonar, but uh, what I'm talking about today is actually a separate project, and this is a project that uh, was originally sparked um, by a request uh, to, to address a problem that DOD is having, and it was a Army Research Lab slash OSD SBIR. Um, and uh, they were concerned with the ability of DOD managers and engineers uh, on these projects to uh, tackle the problems that are coming up in the very large uh, DOD projects, things like Joint Strike Fighter, 
uh, future combat system, F-22, avionics. Uh, these were or are large uh, projects, often with tens of millions of lines of code, and it's been difficult to get the systems uh, to uh, uh, go from, from early conception all the way to uh, a working implementation smoothly, uh, to say the least. Um, I think this, uh, the concerns about size also apply in the world of, of spacecraft, more generally avionics. So this is a chart drawn from a, a report a few years ago uh, that NASA did on, on flight software complexity. And the important thing to note here is the, uh, the scale here is log. So when you see a straight line here, that's an exponential growth um, over time. And of course, the, the, uh, the current uh, level of complexity is higher for the, the red bars, which are the, the human rated missions, and then, uh, but the robotic missions are uh, <coughs> advancing at the same rate, although from a lower starting position. Um, uh, earlier, we were looking at the slides, and we noticed that there was a, there was actually a robotic mission that looks like it had about 50 lines of code. So <laughs> don't ask me about that. I don't, I, it's 1968. I haven't looked into it. But if only we could still do it in 50 lines. All right, so this isn't restricted to uh, spacecraft, of course. You see the same thing um, in uh, automobile software. Once again, this is a, a, a log scale chart. Um, and uh, this is kind of showing a similar growth. In this case, uh, uh, it's the uh, cost of, of uh, weapons uh, aircraft. Um, and once again, it's log scale. And this is just to confirm that Yes, the systems are getting bigger at an exponential rate, but it's not the fact that we're building those exponentially larger systems <coughs> for the same cost. Cost is going up at the same rate, too. Um, right, so the motivation behind this project was, uh, how do you get a grasp on these, these large systems? Obviously, um, we can't keep building larger and larger systems and, and dumping more and more money into them. Eventually, they're just going to consume the entire uh, DOD budget, the entire revenue of the tax revenue of the, of the country. Um, so we need to get a, a better idea of what's happening in these projects, better visibility into you know, what's going wrong, what pieces are high quality, what pieces are low quality, and so on. The result of not being able to, to get that vision into, into project status and, and, and project quality is uh, um, they're, they're, these projects are unwieldy. They often exceed time and cost estimates, often by very large margins. Um, if you're in Congress, taxpayers are angry. If you're in DOD, the Congress is angry. Some examples, I mentioned F-22. So Cypress High is another example of a big project that's had a lot of, of overruns and, and uh, gotten a lot of negative attention because of it. Uh, one example that we used, um, not in the DOD space, but uh, uh, we were working with Cisco Cisco builds the, uh, a lot of the networking infrastructure that runs the internet. And they have an operating system uh, called iOS. It's a separate iOS from the one on your phone. Um, and this is actually a, a 20 million line of code behemoth controlling the router. And they were running into uh, problems where if, if they make a change to the code, it takes 24 to 36 hours just to rebuild. And once they do that, they don't know if they have to retest everything or just a, a subpart. And the, the problem was that they've got dependencies scattered everywhere. So if you look at one procedure, there's no real rhyme or reason as to what other procedures might be calling it, what, what modules do and don't depend on it. Um, and they were trying to uh, solve this problem by doing a kind of a, a node and edge visualization of the system, but none of the tools they had uh, could scale to a 20 million line of code call graph. So what, we're, what we set out to develop in the, in the project, which is actually it's completed now and, and moved on, uh, is, was a canvas for understanding a large system. And, and we think that there's all sorts of applications once you have a canvas suitable for exploring a large system, things like assessing status or spotting risks. Um, now, uh, some key properties we, we thought it, it needed to uh, support were it had to work at multiple levels. So it's great if you can take the big picture and look at it, but that's never the end of your investigation. What usually happens is you spot something that looks suspicious and then you want to dive in and, and dig in deeper. 
and then you find a subpart of your system that's uh, causing the problem there, and you want to dive in further. So you want to, uh, it, it has to work at high level and medium level and low level and, and do so smoothly. You, you don't want to be switching tools to investigate different levels. Of course, it's got to handle very large systems, and we didn't want to restrict ourselves to 100,000 lines of code. That's not that big by today's standards. Um, another key requirement we tried to satisfy was ease of use. So we wanted this to be something that engineers would gladly pick up and use to solve the problems that they were facing. We didn't want it to be something that um, required a lot of training or a lot of uh, learning to master how to, how to use the interface. And so we want it to be as simple and in intuitive as possible. All right, so I think the best way to show you what uh, we came up with and, and maybe talk about the approach a bit is to show you a demo. Uh, all right. So this is a, we call it a, a dependency graph um, for about three and a half million lines of code. Um, what you're seeing is the Wireshark uh, uh, it's a network monitoring tool um, in addition to all the libraries that it calls. So for example, Wireshark has a GUI component that, uh, that it uses the uh, X11 display system. And so uh, the X11 display system is in this dependency graph. Um, Wireshark uses the GTK library for a lot of its uh, GUI widgets and, and utility code. So that that is there too. We put an edge between two components if, in this case, if Wireshark calls GTK, then there's an edge there. And see, I can click on that edge and it will show me all the, de the dependencies. And, and the edges here represent call edges. So the, on the left here, you'll see um, about Wireshark is a function within Wireshark and that calls uh, this function IA GTK label set markup. Um, and so we've built the whole system, or we've, we've captured that, that information for the whole system. This is about four, 500,000 nodes. And so if you give this kind of thing to GraphViz, it's never going <coughs> to finish laying it out. But uh, we've built the system so that uh, it does handle very large uh, uh, call graphs. All right, and so um, you know, I mentioned how uh, we wanted to be able to support multiple levels of investigation. So uh, the nice thing about this system is uh, if you want to, say, explore something, you can just zoom in and do it. And this is uh, pretty close to what you expect from a system like Google Earth or Google Maps. Those systems were actually a big inspiration for this approach. But it, as you zoom in, you'll see a similar dependency uh, layout and graph. Um, and that just reflects the, the intercomponent dependencies of the subsystem. So here I'm looking at the free type library. This is one of the libraries involved in this Wireshark build. Um, and the free type library has these individual components and you can see the dependency relation. So there's a, a base component in the middle and then there's various uh, components along the outside that call into it. So it, it's pretty clear just from this, this picture that base is kind of a utility library for free type and then there are various uh, uh, components that build on that, that utility library. And then if you want to see the uh, the interface with the outside world, you can follow these edges uh, that are leading outside of free type. So here you can see that something is uh, calling from a, a library called Pango into free type, um, and you can kind of trace down to see uh, what subcomponents are being called, and eventually you can, you can go in far enough to see individual functions. So these are individual functions in the system. And now we structured the information and the way it's displayed in, in, in the tool so that you can just kind of pick where you want to you know, zoom in and out and in and out, just like you can in Google Earth and Google Maps. And so at Cisco, they found, uh, this is, uh, they used an earlier version of this, but they were able to identify the modules that looked like scrambled eggs, basically. Um, change, you know, put the dependencies in order, and then when they revisualized it, they could see that they were in, in proper order. Um, so an example of something that you might want to do here is if you're poking around, um, you see that, uh, oh, that's strange, OpenSSL is for some reason required 
to build Wireshark. And why is that? Well, it looks like there's a dependency from Xorg server to OpenSSL. If you want to, if you think that's excessive, maybe you're trying to minimize the amount of build time or the, the space required for this executable, um, you can click on an edge and you can see that actually there's just a few hash functions that are being used in Xorg server and they, they call code within OpenSSL. So OpenSSL has 4,000 functions, but only three or so are being directly called by, by Xorg server. So one way you could refactor the system to, to make it smaller is replace OpenSSL with a smaller dedicated hashing library. Um, maybe that's feasible, maybe it, it's not, but it it's, it's at least gives you a head start on, on possible refactoring. Um, now, like Google Earth and Google Maps, we have a built-in search engine. So, for example, if I want to look for the main functions in this system, I can do a search for main. If I scroll down, I'll find all the actual mains. And then if you click, it'll, it will take you straight to that spot. Just zoom into it like it does in Google Earth. Um, now, if you do want to do an investigation of, of kind of sub-pieces, you can select a few of them and then focus in on them and kind of remove the extraneous material for a temporary investigation. Um, and we also support, uh, let me focus again, uh, various layout options. Um, so sometimes the, the, the layout option that's the default one doesn't really fit. Um, so for example, this is a, a layout that shows calls progressing from left to right. And that can be useful if you're worried about dependencies, you want to detect, detect cyclic dependencies, that sort of thing. Um, all right. So I guess I'll... All right, so I hope it, it sort of conveys just the, the depth of this and size of this canvas. And, and how big a, a system we can support. We haven't really found a system that is too big. Um, so I've got a few minutes left, and I think I'll just, I'll take that time to talk a little bit about, um, oh, so one important note. Uh, what I was showing you was uh, call graphs, but in principle, the same, we can use the same visualization for any kind of dependency relationship. So if you're worried about, uh, on the left, there's an include graph. Um, if you've got architectural diagrams that are very complicated, maybe a you know, big hairy UML diagram, um, you could uh, you know, view that in this system too. All we need is some notion of a, of a dependence uh, with nodes and edges and a hierarchy, and then we can give you a browsable version of that system. Um, so in the upper right, this, this is a, a model we extracted from a, a tool at University of California, Berkeley, uh, called Ptolemy for model-based design. Uh, right, and so I, I mentioned Google Earth a couple times uh, as, as sort of a, an analogy, and really it, it's, it's uh, been kind of a, a guiding light in terms of, of adapting uh, or in, in terms of implementing the system. So the, the idea is similar to Google Earth. You have a server that has a huge amount of data, and then you just ship it to the client as the client needs it to display. And so, um, so that get, lets you uh, browse the surface of the Earth in a very smooth fashion. In Google Earth, we're doing the same thing for uh, uh, very large graphs. Um, one key uh, technique is using graphics hardware for visualization. So we're using OpenGL so that we can exploit all the capabilities of a, a modern graphics card. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see all the, those nodes and edges moving smoothly and zooming in and out. Um, right, so to in, in order to uh, do this kind of Google Earth technique, we need to break information into layers. Um, part of that is taking the component relationship of a, of a system and using that as sort of a, you know, a component is uh, a region on the, on the surface and then subcomponents are states within it and counties and so on. We do a certain amount of pre-processing so that um, when the client uh, asks for something because it's about to display it because the camera is in the right position, the server can re retrieve it quickly. Um, and uh, we don't only use kind of the Google Earth inspiration as uh, um, just for the kind of behind the scenes 
stuff too. We also try to use the, the idea of a map as a user interface um, for showing dense information uh, just because it's something that people work with all the time anyway and it, and it seems to resonate with people. They can use a system, treat it like a map and they don't really need training in how to use it. Um, all right, so this is just kind of illustrating how the amount of information that we show and that we ship to the display client uh, depends on where the camera is. And as you kind of drill down the system, you're showing maybe the same number of nodes, but you're excluding the top level nodes and you're excluding a vast amount of the, the leaf <coughs> nodes in the system. Um, right, so we've uh, I showed you a, a demo of three and a half million lines of code. At Cisco, they were using it with 20 million lines. Um, right, so we've Actually, just I think today or yesterday, we shipped a version of Code Sonar that includes this capability in it. So the very latest version of Code Sonar will let you browse these graphs um, if you're analyzing your project with Code Sonar. Um, and as I said, the underlying technology can be applied to any kind of hierarchical system with uh, with uh, internal connections. Um, and if you're interested in, in setting up some kind of pilot project where we uh, deploy the technology for you, um, contact me, and I think we'd be interested in, in talking about that. Um, all right, so I think that's about it. I uh, should say it's uh, partly funded by the Army, the ARL, and Office of the Secretary of Defense, and some other funding came from, the, from NRL. Um, you can contact me at this email address if you have questions about the project or are interested in potential applications. Then Curtis is at the back if you want to talk about our static analysis technology. Um, and then if you don't get a chance to talk to Curtis, you can always send email to info at grammatech.com. All right, so I've got a, a few minutes for some questions. Yeah. Uh, have you run the tool against itself? Uh, yes. Uh, so the question was, have you run the tool against itself? Um, so we have, we've definitely run it on Code Sonar, which is actually a fairly large system at this point. It includes a Python interpreter, and all sorts of libraries, including Boost, which is just a, a huge tangle of stuff. Um, uh, one tricky thing is um, much of the rendering client is written in Java. Code Sonar um, is, is a C and C++ tool, or at least it was. We've got a prototype that's working with Java. But we did have an in-house uh, a prototype that would generate the dependency graph for, for Java. And it did drive some of our internal refactoring and, and architecture design for the, for the Java uh, rendering tool. Yeah. So one of the things I thought was interesting is, as far as a, a very practical use was, you know, for example, you could look at what areas look like scrambled eggs and then go back. Um, well, so uh, I said earlier that we wanted this to be kind of a canvas that you could explore your system with. And so uh, I sort of skipped this for the sake of questions, but uh, one thing you can do, and I'll talk through it and hopefully <coughs> get to it, um, but you can project um, data onto this canvas. And so in the latest version of Code Sonar, um, we collect things like cyclomatic complexity, and we also collect the number of uh, bugs that we detect in every part of the code. And so you can color your system uh, accordingly. So uh, one thing you can do is um, you, you see the same view and then you color things dark red if they've got a lot of bugs. And then you zoom in further and you can identify which functions within that subsystem are the ones that are really causing your problems. And so what, it, it, what I think it really will do well at is um, getting an understanding of large systems like that. You know, where do I need to focus my effort out of the big picture um, to uh, repair security issues or, uh, you know, where are my unit tests failing? These are questions you can answer with big spreadsheets and, and big text files, but it's very hard to, to use those effectively to get kind of a, an overall view. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so that we, um, our static analysis tools can, can collect that information, they do right now, and we're in the process of connecting it to the, to the visualization <laughs> tool so that um, an edge doesn't just represent a call from one procedure to another, but could be one file's including another, or it's using a type, or it's using a global variable, that kind of information. I mean, that's definitely, I mean, these are not the only dependencies that matter in, in programs. Um, and so I think uh, the next version of Code Sonar or some future version will, will address that, that need. Um, well, so that's, I think that would be a great application uh, um, and, and be, be interesting to compare dynamic to the static, um, for example. So one thing, uh, it's hard to pick up calls through function pointers with static analysis. And so if you have a dynamic analysis, that would supplement your static analysis. Um, and with dynamic analysis, you could also add frequency information. So, you know, there may be six edges coming out of this component but only one of them gets hit all the time, and it gets hit all the time. And maybe that tells you uh, something about your program that's not evident from the, s the static layout. Um, so here's an example of coloring by, in this case, a uh, number of metric, or a number of warnings that we've detected in a project. So you can see um, some components are dark red, some are pink, and some are, are white. And those reflect different levels of danger as defined by de problems detected by code sonar. Thank you.